Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here, everybody. I'm Laura Salyer, and I have an audacious vision for our future. So hang with me here, because we're going to cover a lot in this hour. It is going to be a lecture unlike any, and very much participation is encouraged. Doodling is encouraged. We're going to unpack some of our creativity that's been dormant. And my audacious vision is if we prioritize creativity and flow within our medical careers, burnout cannot exist. And you're going to see why. But first, please, let's start uh, nimbling up our digits and warm up the chat. Uh, go ahead and answer this. If you had the gift of a free Saturday, what would we find you doing? I would like to hear. And while you're typing it in, this is good to get those fingers going. I'm going to continue. Who am I? Why am I here talking about this? I'm your chief catalyst. And again, Lara Salier, DO, IFMCP. So I'm an osteopathic family physician, also certified in functional medicine. I'm a Midwest mom of three. Oh, good. I see some chats coming in. Let me move that to the other side. So keep those chats coming in. I'm a Mid Midwest mom of three, married to another physician. That was by accident. He wooed me with his Wisconsin accent, but I burned out 15 years into my career. I had done everything right. And yet I found myself in a state of burnout. So I started drawing and painting and running and experiencing this flow state, which made me feel curious and helped me see that we are missing a lot of that in our medical careers. And there are ways to bring it back. After I started learning more, I resigned from family medicine. I certified with functional medicine. I wrote a book and I started training with the Flow Research Collective on how I can train flow acquisition in doctors, in nurses, in PAs. And my goal is to infuse flow back into our medical career because it was there at one point. I also believe that dogs are better than humans. And I believe that we are each individual catalysts of change in healthcare. Here's some disclosures real quick. Burnout is systemic. This is not ignoring all the systems at play. This is not a Pollyanna lecture like you may have seen in the past. Burnout is real. Experiences are highly personal. My burnout story is going to be different than yours. I am just sharing my lived experiences as a cis white woman, but also recognizing that I want to have a comfortable space to include marginalized populations, amplifying their voices. Everybody has a story. You're going to hear evidence-based information from neuroscience on psychology, human behavior, thought work in some of my catalyst services, but let's not ignore that some of the origination of some of these practices like sound healing or, or uh, positive visualization, they can stem from ancient, ancient indigenous cultures. One more disclosure, this is not me. I do not moonlight as the equate allergy rep. So here's our agenda, simple three things. We're going to unpack the neuroscience of burnout, discover the power of creative flow, and then you're going to learn a high altitude level of what the aha method is so that you can start catalyzing more flow into your day, into your work life masterpiece. If you signed up, you should have a copy of the playbook. And that's like a wonderful little accompaniment. You don't have to have this right by your side as we go through, but I use some of these in my larger training sessions that you can use over and over again to keep yourself on track and keep finding more ways to prime yourself for flow. So let's talk about the neuroscience of burnout. Okay, let's unpack that for a bit. And we'll start at the beginning. If you have access to the chat, I would encourage you to say, if you can think, what is the one question we ask every five-year-old? Absolutely, I think not one five-year-old will pass without having this question at least several times. And if you don't have access to the chat, I'll answer in just a moment. But I'm curious if everybody knows the answer to this one. What do you want to be when you grow up? Right? Talk about pressure on a five-year-old. So here's, I, here's me at the white coat ceremony years ago, 1996, brand new medical student, met my husband there. We ended up marrying and moving to Monroe, Wisconsin. We are known for our cheese and we celebrate it every other year. It's a rural town in Wisconsin, big farming community. This is where we chose to raise and torture our three children, some of them wishing they had different parents. 
But I signed up to be a family medicine physician specifically because of this. I wanted to be that doctor, to put their stethoscope to the fuzzy chest of a teddy bear, to know the whole family, to take care of the babies and the grandmas, to embrace my staff as a family. And quickly, within 12 years of my career, it was this. I felt like a robot holding a clipboard. Instead of clicking with a patient at their bedside, I was clicking a computer mouse. And instead of measuring vital signs, I was measured by press gainy. It didn't make sense. You know, we tell gifted kids that life is going to take you places. And this is what we think, right? We're going to be doctors or nurses, and we're going to be excited and giving back and enthusiastic. We're helpers. And yet, instead of going to beautiful places, we end up going right to burnout. And this is what it looks like. Our expectations and our reality do not match. And we're left feeling confused, but actually we're feeling grief. Grief is the loss of expectation, not just a death of a person or a relationship. It's a loss of what you thought would be happening. And it is not the reality you're faced with. And grief is painful because in our brain, it produces a signature brainwave pattern under the functional MRI. And burnout is identical to grief in your brain. And it's impossible to think clearly. I mean, imagine taking your car to a mechanic who just lost their spouse. They may have trouble checking those boxes on the warranty, right? Now, we expect grief in our culture. We talk about grief. We have vocabulary around grief. It is a normal human condition, and we have support. We have support groups. We, we lean on friends and family. But why don't we have the same for burnout? It's the same thing in our brain. We talk about, well, if you get burned out, but why not when you get burned out? I mean, we're all going to suffer grief. We're all going to suffer burnout. It may not be in your career. It could be burnout at being a mom, burnout in your relationship. Burnout happens to everybody. And it's characterized by three things, depersonalization, low perceived achievement, and emotional exhaustion. In other words, you feel cynical because you can't find yourself or your personality in what you're doing. You're so disconnected. You also don't feel like you're making a difference. Where is the achievements? Where are the milestones? You're lost in the shuffle and barely keeping afloat. And then you're running on fumes. Your emotions are deadpan, right? Now there's a difference. Stress is over-engagement. It's self-recognizable. We understand, we use that word over and over and over vocabulary. We're stressed. And studies show that stress can be alleviated by just staying home in your pajamas instead of going to a party, by having a spa day or taking a vacation. However, burnout is a little more lethal. It's where you feel really detached, you're hopeless, and these are the individuals at risk for suicide. And this is where you just want to respond to an email with a crayon and tears. It's happening earlier and earlier. It's not just the older doctors that just can't get with the computer technology. That's what we were told when we were young medical students. No, it is everywhere. It starts even in medical school. We're seeing burnout is just so systemic that we all agree it's a problem. However, many of us don't have any resources or we cope with alcohol or we're reluctant to seek mental health treatment. And this is why we have a 400% increase in suicidality for female physicians. What do we blame? We blame bureaucratic tasks. And I think we'd all agree if you were around before this pivotal time in medicine, you may know what I'm about to say next. There was one point in medicine where we had everything change, and it's when we had the Cures Act. So for those that don't know, the Cures Act, before it was in place, we had roughly 10.3% of patients that would look at their results prior to receiving information from their provider which would result in 77 messages on average sent to their provider. After the Cures Act, when labs are released, 
we now have 40.3% of patients looking at these labs without any frame of reference and flooding our inbox, right? That's not very healthy for us. So family doctors will spend 86 minutes of pajama time with their EHRs, but actually that's an old metric. It's worse. In our EHR, we spend 50% of our day. One clinical hour equates to two hours. This is research by Shanafelt and Maslach. Across the world, American physicians have 2.6 times the portal messages and our notes are four times longer. But before we wanna blame and point our finger, EHR factors will only explain 20% of the variance of burnout, right? So that's really interesting. Only 20% we can blame on electronic medical records. And what have you done to try to alleviate the burnout? Look at the bottom, nothing. We haven't done anything. And I'm not saying it's blaming us. This is systemic. But there's a lot of ways that we can start saving ourselves. The problem is, how many of us have sat in a boring but well intentioned lecture, maybe similar to this, although this is different, aimed at resiliency, right? Oh, come on, let's do more yoga or meditation. There's not enough lavender in the world that's going to help burnout. We don't need more resiliency. In fact, physicians had higher personal resilience scores than any other field. Each one point increase was associated with a decrease of burnout. But 29% of physicians with the highest resiliency scores were still burned out. It's all because we have a loss of autonomy. We don't have a sense of control anymore. We have watched as our careers were promised to us that it would get better and it hasn't. And it's gone so out of our scope that we're feeling like, okay, well, life is falling apart and now we're used to it. In your packet, there is a burnout scale that is adapted from Maslach in her research. It also has prompts at the bottom. I encourage you, as I work with institutions and hospitals, I encourage the same thing. Xerox copy this, give it to friends, to staff, to coworkers, and do this once a quarter. It is like vital signs. One measurement is not going to help, but the more you trend and watch, is there a similar category every quarter that I'm scoring low in? How can I change this? Then you can start really diving into your source of burnout. Burnout is emotional trauma that literally is transforming your own physiology as we speak. So as we're burned out, we're feeling these sense of grief and meaninglessness and depersonalization and stress and all of these things speak to our DNA and are changing our cellular physiology. In this study, they measured the first year of training for physicians, aged our DNA six years. They measured our telomeres, which are like those plastic end caps on shoelaces, and they're just supposed to protect the DNA inside. Well, we are aging at an exponential rate. It has to do with our limbic system, right? And no hate to the limbic system. It's there for a reason. It's protecting us. All it wants is for us to thrive, either to seek out pleasure or to avoid pain. And all of us have our limbic system on 24 seven. We spend our day mostly in our prefrontal cortex, thinking about what's going on, planning, organizing. You're listening to my words right now with the prefrontal cortex, but you also have your hippocampus and all day long, they're communicating, you're storing memories, you're retrieving information, but we all have an amygdala. This is our emotional fear response. And it also is just trying to keep us alive. It is unique. It senses it could be just a vision of a red car passing by or the whiff of a cologne or anything. And it can imply whether is this something to run from or, or should we be scared? And it may not even be fully triggered, but when it is even just a little, especially chronically, it can block your ability to think clearly. Hence why grief and burnout really make it hard for you to be the best at your cognitive abilities. When that amygdala is also triggered, you 
have your hypothalamus, which is like your EMS, your emergency system of your body. You have palms sweaty, heart racing, cortisol pumping, and it happens all day long. This is why no two amygdala are alike and why no solution to burnout is going to fit for everybody, but you're going to see in a moment how this one can be adapted to help you start pedaling back. You might look at this train track and think of a summer with your grandfather walking along, picking dandelions, the warm sun on your skin, the fragrant breeze, and it brings up happy memories. But maybe somebody else watching this is thinking of poverty. They lived by train tracks. It was always dirty and loud and scary. And their amygdala is suggesting something completely different. And if you don't believe that your limbic system is there, here is an image I will show you that will absolutely activate all of our limbic systems, guaranteed. In this next slide, if you were to dig your hand deep into a winter coat, and I'm from Wisconsin, so we always have treasures found in our pockets of our winter coats, but you know, put it on the 1st of September, I should say, it gets cold, and you dig your hands deep, and if you find this in your pocket, it's going to trigger you now. It didn't five years ago, but now it comes with a whole host of different feelings and memories. And even if you're logically not thinking them, your limbic system absolutely is remembering that because your brain is changing. You're starting to have weaker correlations between that amygdala and your prefrontal cortex. So you have difficulty controlling negative emotions. This is why burnout is contagious and it impacts your mitochondria. Yes, I know those tiny little organelles. They're the powerhouses. They take the oxygen, the fats, carbs, and proteins, right? They make ATP. We know this, but did you know they're also emotines? They're very peculiar. Mitochondria, when they're stressed and they're in that environment, if they're not, and they're healthy, they're normal. If they're feeling good, they've got all the nutrients they need. They're getting good sleep circadian rhythms. They're great. They actually like to hug. They're fused together. They're well hydrated, but when they're stressed and they're bathed in cortisol and irregular habits and patterns and chronic amygdala activation, they start to shrink. They don't want to touch each other. They don't want to do their job. They produce less energy. Worse, they start producing cytokines like teens going to their room, slamming the door and playing their loud rock music. They start to produce inflammatory cytokines causing a low level of systemic inflammation and they shorten our telomeres. We know all this. We, we know the ACE study. When you're growing up in neglect or trauma, you are going to have health outcomes and disparities. And look at our practitioners. We are participating in our own a study, right? We're caught in sympathetic overdrive and we have forgotten how to downshift. So this is a field called psychoneuroimmunology. It's talking about a convergence of disciplines, the nervous system, endocrine, the immune system. All of them communicate through neurotransmitters, hormones, cytokines. All of them have different labels for diagnosis of disease, but all of them have something in common it is a stressor. And might I add an adjective, a perceived stressor, because we can change and rewire using neuroplasticity, our perception of stress. One person's party can be the next person's nightmare. If you're an introvert or extrovert, we all have different ways that we view reality. And our gut talks to our brain via the vagus nerve and this pathway, the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic. And so as we go along life, we're alternating between healthy gut stability and intestinal permeability because this can be altered. You can have a breach in that membrane. And when your gut is not as healthy, whether you just had a bunch of stress or maybe horrible sleep patterns, maybe medications, too much alcohol, bad food, then you start having this breach and your intestinal permeability leads to this metabolic endotoxinemia, kind of like a fever without feeling hot. You just have lots of inflammation deep in the cellular level. We see this obviously with irritable bowel, that makes sense, but we also see it in non-GI illnesses, fibromyalgia, Parkinson's. We see intestinal permeability in heart disease, in PTSD and trauma. 
this is a marker that is starting to show that we might say we're fine, but we're not. And so asking people, you know, really, what is your real feel? It's like being in Wisconsin. I never trust the weatherman when they say 30 degrees, but really what's the real feel? It's usually like negative 10. Sometimes we need a pattern interrupt to honestly look at ourselves and say, what is going on? How am I doing? My pattern interrupt happened in 2016 when my nurse came onto my, into my room, dropped an obituary on the desk. And normally that would make me open my desk drawer and pen a little short note to the family. This, this woman was 86. She had died after a, a brave battle with cancer, had lots of great family. But instead of writing a note, I felt relieved. I had one less prior auth, one less work in, one less refill, one less nursing home order to sign. And I felt ashamed. That's not the kind of family doctor I had signed up to be. It was not congruent with where I thought I was headed. And my reality and expectations were so far apart, I couldn't even connect them. So that caused me to pause and reevaluate what I needed to do to bring back this well being and joy. And sometimes you have to have chaos in order to give birth to a dancing star. So let's talk about this. What about creative flow? Why are we talking about creativity? Well, we talk about burnout is like grief, emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and low perceived achievement. So what is the opposite of burnout in your brain? It's engagement, right? You want a state that feels really energized and you feel vigorous. You have a sense of significance. You're making a difference. You're deeply engrossed and, and your ego dissolves. You're selfless. That would be ideal. Well, guess what? That is the same thing as flow state which is a state coined and discovered by Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, the Hungarian-American professor who studied flow for decades. And he coined several criteria. Here are the top four. A sense of selflessness. Your ego dissolves. And this is all confirmed in neuroscientific uh, measures. Timelessness. Either time elongates or it, it is compressed, but you feel completely absorbed. There's an effortlessness to this state and a richness of all five senses. You're locked in because humans do appreciate a little bit of stress, a little bit of good stress, that optimal performance in the middle, that's flow. If it's too easy, it's boring. If it's too hard, it's overwhelming. So a flow cycle is something that we can plan for. It starts with struggle just a little bit little bit of cortisol, a little bit of norepinephrine, like I said, a little bit of a challenge that makes you think, can I do this? Do I have the skills? They're almost equally matched. And then you have a release, which is when alpha waves come forward, you have nitric oxide and it's that aha, that epiphany. Then you get into flow, which most people think is just something for lucky people, but you can plan this. You can look for ways to induce flow into your day. And that's dopamine, endorphins. It feels really good anywhere from five to 90 minutes long. And then you have a recovery phase, which is crucial to help you go back into another flow cycle. And when you learn how to prime your brain and sequence your own flow, you have more meaning more learning and memory, more innovation, and more productivity. And why creativity? Creativity is adding more meaning. It positively impacts your health. We see that it has metrics to decrease your burnout, and it balances hormones and stress. And I love what Dr. Shelley Carson said. Creativity is a brain pattern that can be amplified with a little bit of effort, a little bit of practice. Oftentimes, we get stuck on the word creative. Creative, and I don't know how many of you, I'm not seeing responses. So maybe you're just thinking this in your head, which I totally get. You're on your lunch break, or maybe it's morning or dinner, but you know, this is for you. So just sit back and relax, take this in however you will. We get stuck on the word creative. If you ask a room full of children, kindergartners, how many of you are artists? Like 100% would raise their hand. Fast forward to high school, not many, and adults, sure, certainly we think, no, I mean, you have to be born creative, and that is false. Creativity is in all of us. It's simply something novel and something meaningful. That is it. That's the definition of creativity. Carl Jung said the newness in an individual psyche is an endlessly varied recombination of age-old components. T.S. Eliot 
a good poet borrows from authors remote in time. You don't have to be Michelangelo. A piece of paper folded up is creative. A lid for a mask is creative. And children know that when they are more creative, they feel better. This is why at recess, they're, they're gauging for team sports and wanting to pick kids that will help them get into group flow. They love to use their hands and get messy. They don't need permission. They feel the results, just like you and I could. Whenever you do anything creative, you have an increased blood flow to the reward center of your brain. You have better mental states. You will have better control of stress and relaxation. You will fail safely and understand you can handle those emotions all because of flow state. Here's the kicker though. You can enhance flow. You can also disrupt flow. And flow enhancers will lower cognitive load. They will also stimulate a release of dopamine and they result in increased energy. So here's some examples of flow enhancers. Here's some common ones, a rich environment, something breathtaking and vast, right? There's the biophilia hypothesis that, which is why we see landscape pictures in hospitals. Patients have been known to recover faster if they can see nature, same thing, uh, good mood serotonin, curiosity. It helps you with openness. So a good musical playlist, right? Something risky. That's why video games are very flow forward. Novelty. Dopamine loves something new. Gratitude absolutely helps you get into flow. Deep embodiment and clear goals. Where are you headed? How are you doing? All of us have one flow enhancer we do every day, hopefully. At least if you're over 13 years old, you should. And that's a shower. Why? Because it's lowering our cognitive load. We get into a shower, we're in autopilot, but we're also deeply engrossed in our senses. We're feeling the water and our brain is allowed to just go on the back burner, our frontal prefrontal cortex, and then the alpha brain waves can come forward and you start having these connections, these aha moments. And you might leave that shower going, oh my gosh, I just finally got that. I finally remembered what I was trying to solve that problem or what I should do next, which is why 72% of us have these events happen in the shower. Now, likewise, there's flow disruptors, chronic stress, thought errors, right? Maybe we're having some, you know, not healthy cognitive biases or a fixed mindset, improper fueling, all these poor time management. All of us carry a flow disruptor in our pocket, our cell phone absolutely disrupts us. So let's do a compare contrast. This is exactly where all of us can start helping ourselves because you can recognize it isn't your fault. You are not burned out because of a flaw. And burnout is not something that anybody will escape unless they know the steps to pedal back. And sometimes it helps to look at history. So let's look. Here is a doctor's visit. Let's count the flow enhancers we have, shall we? We have a, pick, uh, a window to the outside. I can tell you lots of clinics do not have that anymore. We also have a simple formulary. We don't have big pharma ads that are asking our patients to come in and then argue with us on the medicines that we pick, right? We also have high touch. We are touching patients. We are communicating with their family. In fact, I would beg that this doctor probably knew all of the family members. And he wasn't forced to see new people because he was squeezing them in and nobody else could see them. And so he's constantly learning about new families. He probably remembers and knows multiple generations. And there's a clock in his room, which says a lot. And that doesn't happen very often in an exam room. And so he's able to control his time and his calendar and his schedule and count on his staff and yell down the hallway, hey, can you just add a CBC to that, please? Can't do that anymore. Everything has to be done by the physician. We have to be doing it all, entering everything in. So look, we have a cell phone that's disrupting us. Here's our flow disruptors. We have a computer screen that we're communicating with more than the patient. We're typing every order in because heaven forbid any of the other staff do that. We're also clicking a mouse. I think like 5,000 times is the latest study. We also have a paperwork pile. Despite having EMR, many of us are still dealing with faxes and nursing home orders. And again, pressures to see patients in less time, not to mention political issues, right? These are things we did not anticipate. 
And it's sad when this is our reality. So I have a short video I want to play for you. And I'm going to just adjust my, my speakers here. So here we go. Make sure you can hear. Okay. Here we go. Um, knock, knock. Hi. Come in. Come in. Oh, I'm sorry. I can come back later. No, it's fine. Come in. I'm just finishing up my morning cry. Well, I'm the new med student. Well, great. Welcome to Family Medicine. You're going to love it here. We uh, take care of patients of all ages, and we also do a lot of magic. You do magic? Yeah, we can fit an hour's worth of patient care into 20 minutes. <laughs> we hate it. Hi, doctor. Sorry to interrupt. I have some paperwork here for you. Should I bring it in? Oh, sure. Come on in. How do you have time for all that? Oh, I don't. Oh. Well, let's get started. First, I'll have you sign this contract promising you'll go into family medicine. I don't think I want to sign this. Please? We need help. So yeah, I love him. Okay. The thing is though, we can help ourselves. Okay. We can't fix the system overnight. We can't fix all our colleagues around us, or maybe even the staff that we work with. We have minimal autonomy over some of the key features, but we can start helping ourselves. When we train surgeons to move their sweat spot to their sweet spot, they actually got into flow more complex tasks felt effortless. They were less likely to make errors. When we have medical students start getting more creative and taking this much needed time, they were able to handle failures and be able to articulate emotions and communication and handle things with resiliency. When I work in my catalyst services, providing these facilitated workshops, people get a chance to play and realize the importance of a simple doodle to exercise your right brain. It can become a lot more than a doodle and it opens up conversation to help ourselves be a little more nuanced, pulling our personality into our career. The thing with burnout is we're losing our control and that's the main thing. So we need to start getting it back. And this study was amazing. It took 10,000 nurses talking about self-efficacy. How do we feel we're doing? And they found that those with the highest rates of neuroticism and introversion had the highest rates of burnout. Makes sense, right? coolest part of the study is that you can train a person to have more self-efficacy. In other words, training you to take care of yourself, benchmarking your own milestones that might be different than your organization, taking account of the time and the calendar that you have and your own strengths focused persona, you can actually mitigate your own burnout. So everyday creative activity is a path to flourishing. It correlates long after that activity is gone. So let's get down to it and learn just a little bit of the aha method. Like we said, burnout is these three things. So let's solve in reverse. Instead of feeling depersonalized, we anchor into a personal mission and meaning for you. Instead of feeling like you're not making a difference, we find milestones and feedback because flow likes feedback. And instead of running on fumes, we activate your embodied energy and flow. That's why it's called aha, anchor, highlight, activate. Aha is after the phrase from Archimedes. If you remember, here's the statue. He is famous for showing us what this epiphany looks like. He is the epitome of the alpha state coming forward in that release, that second part of the flow cycle. He was wondering and persevering over how can I find the volume of, a, of an object and and he worked and toiled and finally just said, ah, and went and took a bath. And it, right when he immersed himself and saw the displacement of water is when he shouted, Eureka, aha. And that is perfect to encapsulate our method that can help you understand how to sequence your own flow. You have a page in your playbook on this. So let's start unpacking. Anchor is the first topic. Anchor is finding yourself, right? Finding your personal buy-in on what you're doing. And if you're familiar with the parable of the bricklayers, 
uh, you're walking along a path, you see one guy toiling in the sun, wiping his brow, putting a brick down, and you ask him, what are you doing? And he says, I'm laying bricks. Walk further along a path, you see a woman, and she's toiling under the sun, wiping her brow, laying down bricks. And you say, what are you doing? She says, I'm building a wall. And then you walk further down and see a third person wiping their brow, throwing a brick down. And you say, what are you doing? And they exclaim, I'm building a kingdom and it is going to serve our nation. And I'm so excited. And that is the difference of somebody who's just working and somebody who's anchoring their own personal beliefs in that mission. When we match our values, our ego goes away and flow happens. We have less burnout. We're feeling more fulfilled. So a quick exercise you can do is avoid the mistakes we use to talk about our aspirational goals. Many of us uh, are outcomes-based, right? I want to own a yacht. I want to do whatever. I want to graduate medical school. I want to get this fellowship or I want to, that's wonderful, but it's also achievements focused. It's very external and it requires external approval. It's also hustle culture. Also, what should I be doing? What should I be doing? And instead, accurately defining your best self based on your values. What do you value? What brings you internal well-being? What comes easy and joyful that you're naturally curious about? And what kind of person do you want to be? We use a lot of positive visualization. It is evidence-based. Neuroscience supports that the more you spend time positively visualizing a future, the more likely you'll make these micro decisions that align with that. And so I use that power in my practice where I have patients draw themselves. I tell them, I want you to, to anchor your future visualization. What would you look like? a year from now after we're done working together and they'll draw themselves meditating or gardening or hiking. And it helps me also clarify what matters to them, what is important. And if this freaks you out and you're like, I don't have really much imagination right now. I am dead tired. I'm post-call. I'm finishing my sandwich as I'm listening to this. Well, then let's start with the end in mind, right? What do you want to be known for? That brings ultimate clarity. As a granddaughter of a funeral director, I can tell you, when you start thinking at the end of your life, what do you want people to be saying about you when you're gone? They're not going to say, oh, they had their charts done in a timely manner. They might say they really enjoyed these things and found ways to put their personality back in their career. They said no. They took time out. They decreased their workload for a day, worked one last day a week. They are making me laugh. They made me laugh. They were all these things that make you you. Are, is what's important. Plain of feature, certainly overweight. She was nevertheless a woman of wit and warmth, right? Or maybe she loved her family more than anything else in the world except cold Budweiser, room temperature Budweiser, mopeds, fall foliage, foliage and the OJ Chase and OJ trial. And finally, I love Pat, world renowned for her lack of patience, not holding back her opinion and a knack for telling it like it is. That's what this personal proclamation is. So I encourage you to fill it out and really think about it. The next step is highlight. And this story is a real one. This is a picture of my kids when I was opening up my clinic six -ish years ago. And they were young and they remember seeing their mom in a busy family practice office. And now I've got this office to myself. And I was getting everything rehabbed, painting the walls. And it was quite empty for a while. My youngest there is kind of a scary kid, right? He's very apprehensive. He really doesn't like risk. And one time I was driving him home and he said, but mom, are you still a doctor? And at the time I felt really triggered. And of course I am. Aren't I? I'm your mom. Even when you're at school, why wouldn't I be a doctor? But his po point of reference, to be fair, was a busy waiting room. And I had to question my identity and highlight a different meaning of success, different milestones than I would, what I was measuring before. It was no longer RVUs. Uh, it was no longer press Ganey. It was a different measurement of success different values. I mean, look at me. I'm a human. I pay taxes. I have depression. I'm behind on chores. That's not what we want. We want to define your own metrics. So in a lot of my catalyst services, we spend a lot of time highlighting what matters and avoiding the trap of a leading versus lagging metric. You can think of this now. What are you measuring? That is a lagging metric. Leading metrics are ones you can control the input you're putting in the, in the project or in the goal. A lagging metric is the outcome. 
And often we only measure the outcomes. And then we feel sad that we're not making it in our world that we had perceived. So if you just shift your measurements to more of a leading input measurement, you find you're happier. It's just like a kid with a sticker chart, you know, maybe not count how many times you picked up your crayons, you know, in, in kindergarten, but maybe other things. How many times did you, were you brave enough to start drawing on the paper? How many times instead of a medical degree, how many hours of studying instead of weight loss, how many miles did you run or weight lifted at the gym instead of a healthy relationship? If that's what you want, measure your date nights and your activities. If you want to be a calm and grounded person, measure how many minutes are you meditating? And if this causes you complete freak out and you're like, I don't know, I don't even know what I would measure for success. I have no idea what milestones. There's a cheat. There's a workaround. UC Davis found it. Gratitude. It's good medicine. They have a lot of science to back up that even just once a day, finding one thing to be thankful for does the same thing. It makes you feel like you're achieving. It makes you feel good. It actually decreases your stress, decreases inflammation, and it gives you a positive feedback loop of dopamine. Lastly, activate. This is about this emotional fortitude, this energy. We don't want people to be depleted. We want you to save your brain, keep the neural plasticity, encourage your body to get into flow. And a lot of this is in how we recover. Flow is addicting. Autotelic is the name. It feels good. You have all these wonderful neurochemicals, but you can't skip the recovery. And recovery is just as important. Interoception is a sense that a lot of us have let diminish because medical training trains it out of us. We learn to hold our bladder, to suppress our hunger, to mask our emotions. And interoception is how we feel inside. It's paying attention to how we feel. And we don't do that. We don't take time to do that. We don't feel that it's important, but actually it is. It gives you this emotional fluency that you need just to communicate with yourself at bare minimum, and hopefully to your friends or your partner. When we train interoception to improve, you actually do improve your emotional regulation. You have better decisions that are more clear and aligned with your values. You are able to communicate better and you have more altruism. So here's something you can try now. I have all my residency Xerox. This you can find it at thefeelingswheel.com. Put it in your lounge, in your room, on your fridge at home. And you can even have a little marker or a magnet or a pin for each family member or coworker, and they can put where they feel that day. Even just identifying where they feel is powerful because we don't take the time. But a second level of that is then asking where the somatic address is of that emotion. Where does it live? So if you feel joyful, where does that live? Is it in your ears, if you're feeling apprehensive, where does that live? Is it in your neck? You start to pay attention to this and then you experience the glory of bottom up decision making. Your body will notify you before your logical head will. That's the art of medicine, right? We've all been there. You've been in an exam room and something is off because you're using other intuitive skills. And we need to do that for ourselves so that we're not caught down a road where we're just doing things because logically we think we're supposed to let your body inform you of decisions when they're off or when you're on the right track. So here's how you can prime for more flow. Stop task switching, get clear, just one thing at a time because you're exhausting your attention networks. Start practice that unitasking, start improving that emotional fluency and start fueling those mitochondria, those poor little mitochondria. I know the Krebs cycle is scary, right? But mitochondria, they have a pause and play button. Here's the thing. We're unfortunately activating TNF-alpha and NF-kappa B, which are highly inflammatory. So we're cooking with Teflon. We might be using tanning beds. We're getting our sugars aren't that controlled. We're, our gut microbiome is a mess. And all these things are causing our mitochondria to shrink, like you saw. And they're making less ATP. But you can also press the play button, activate NRF2 and Fill your plates with leafy greens, take some L-carnitine, coenzyme Q10, broccoli, green tea, garlic, and you'll have more energy. 
In the past, we used to laugh at all the things we did to cope, right? Smoke your anxiety away, take butasol. Uh, we're not that much better. How many times in like the, the residence lounge, you see like sticky buns, muffins, Doritos. That's like, here you go, employee appreciation. Here's your cake. Here's your pizza. And that's horrible. Carbohydrates make more depression and anxiety. You know, and, and when you look at how we can have cohorts of people eat healthy vegetables and fruits, they actually feel better. They have more happiness and wellness and flavonoids will bind to GABA receptors and they're neuroprotective and anti-anxiety. So learning about this aha method helps you learn where in your day can you start to be more aware of flow opportunities, flow enhancers? Where can you remove those flow disruptors? How can you change your micro environment so that we can all benefit from a macro change? Ideally, I want no more average practitioners. I want everyone to be a catalyst, to be boundaried, organized, anti-burnout, engaged. When you learn how to consistently anchor to your personal values, it affects your decisions. You can easily hide, hide, highlight decisions that support your goals, which then drive your behavior to activate better energy and you catalyze more well being. And it's an endless upward spiral. I also like going to institutions and running a catalyst culture vibe check. And that is defined as a flow channeled environment that's also anti burnout. And this is from the Flow Research Collective. Here's 10 criteria, and you can check your own culture to see if they have it. Some are good, some are not. I'll give you an opportunity to download this because this is not included in your little booklet. Um, so get your phones ready if you do, if you are watching this on a laptop, because you can scan the QR code in just a second. Um, so a catalyst culture has 10 criteria. They allow you to have as much autonomy as possible. There's clear goals. Asynchrony is prioritized. In other words, not everything needs your live one-on-one -on -one attention. You are allowed to, to do things when it is convenient for your energy. There's frequent feedback, right? There's feedback that is critical, but also helpful, allowing you to be more efficient. There's integrity in communication from all levels. There's low cognitive drain. In other words, you're not, you're not wondering, you know, how to best use your mind. And you have this, this cadence that feels very appropriate to what you're trained to do efficient operations. There is a burnout evaluation and done routinely and it's strengths focused. If something is not your strength, either they help you train it up or we outsource, we give it to someone else. This is why doctors are going crazy, having to type in the orders, having to do all, they're having to fly the plane, serve the drinks, seat the passengers. And I do believe it's going to get better with a lot of tech advances, but we're in the dark ages. Finally, psychological safety. And that is difficult. Many institutions don't even want to ask how you're doing. There's negative repercussions. If you say you're struggling, heaven forbid you need mental health support. So we have a long way to go, but it's getting there. This is the 10 question quiz, and you will get a personalized restoration plan. And it has that little uh, catalyst flow um, checklist, and it's extensive. I just pulled the top 10. So Get your phone, scan the QR code. It's free. You can always opt out of any future newsletters, but it's really helpful. It has changed a lot of people because they're able to see which part of the aha restoration plan that you should start with first. Where do you need help first? And it gives you a customized plan to your inbox. Um, and it's really my passion because here's the thing. It's not about wearing more armor. This is not about something wrong with you. You don't need more resiliency. That's not going to fix it. I mean, the world is going to be toxic. We're going to be battling against public health measures that were appalled, that patients are seeing big pharma ads, that computers are here, and we're not feeling that the world is going to be toxic. It's not going to change overnight. But we need to save our unique creative sparkle. You've learned today that creativity is not elusive. It's not something you stand outside in the rain and hope that it hits you. You've learned that creativity is powerful, meaningful, accessible, necessary, and medicinal. And we've unpacked the neuroscience of burnout. You've understood how creative flow is quite the antidote. And you've learned just a teeny bit, a homeopathic dose of the aha method that I use. So I'm going to leave you with one final thought experiment. We measure vital signs because they keep us alive. 
temperature, pulse, blood pressure, respiratory rate. And years ago, we added a fifth vital sign, pain. So why are we surprised 20 years later when we're having such difficulty with overdose, depression, and just this dysfunctional existential angst? We have primed our patients to concentrate on pain every single visit. And then we've implied that it's the provider or the physician to help them fix the pain. In other words, we've completely disempowered patients and burdened practitioners with this unrealistic goal because life is painful. Vital signs keep us alive. Pain does not keep us alive. So I'm suggesting a sixth vital sign that you start asking yourself and your patients, what do you do for joy? What lights you up? When is the last time you dusted your hobby off the shelf and you played? Then maybe in 20 years, we might have a reclamation of a true art of healing where we have empowered physicians, self-aware patients, and maybe a whole new world of insight into flow so that medicine can be fun again. So thank you for being a part of my mission to transform the practice of medicine by teaching 1 million health professionals how they can tap into their creativity, regain that autonomy, increase joy, and eradicate burnout. We are at 72,000. And I would love for you to join me at my next Catalyst Symposium. I do this twice a year. It's a five-day virtual boot camp, completely done online, and it is well-received. You learn a lot more of the AHA method. It is actionable. And you walk away with feeling like you have more control more than ever. Coming in 2024, it will have CME attached, but you can scan here just to get the little initial information. And I'd love to see you. Recordings are available, so you don't have to be there in person, but it is life-changing. And once again, thank you for your attention and thank you for this opportunity. And I wish you to keep coloring outside the lines. Thank you so much. I found myself feeling attacked at times. I'm like, that's me. How did you know? <laughs> Are you watching me? <laughs> no, but thank you so much for such an informative presentation. Like that was wonderful. And for for those, thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> really. And for those who are, uh, you know, viewing this, this was actually just more of a uh, Doctors for America. We're starting something new of trying to offer a wellness event, something that pours into us because as doctors, as advocates, as, you know, people who, uh, you know, juggling life and all the things we're constantly giving ourselves, our time, our attention, what have you. And we need to pour into ourselves. So um, with that, again, Dr. Sawyer, thank you so much for the information. Um, again, for participants, um, the digital handbook that was mentioned that will be sent out uh, following today's presentation along with a, uh, the link to this recording. And I invite you all to take one minute to complete two questions, um, just kind of providing your feedback that will help uh, not only us as we move forward, but then also any ideas as to other topics uh, that we want to, that we should touch upon. Um, so yeah, and, 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 and. Dr. Sawyer is available um, on Twitter, on like various social media handles. I'm not on Twitter, but I'm on everything else. Yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so encourage you, yes, to follow her there and follow us here at Doctors for America in the event that you want to be in the know of what's going on. Again, we, we want to offer something like this continually every quarter to, again, help fill our buckets. So. Thank you again, Dr. Sawyer. Appreciate you. Thank you all participants for your time and attention today. And with that, we'll conclude. Have uh, an amazing day. I hope you have many aha moments as we move forward. So thank you all and take care. Thanks. Have a good day. <laughs> Bye.